Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Cheers. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you. Um, great to be back at Sustainability Live and also an angel. I used to live um, up the road, so it's very nice, nice to be back in my old stomping ground. Um, so, yeah, so I work with um, Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership, part of the university, and we work with both government and also finance to look at what it takes to create a sustainable economy. But what I want to talk to you today about is the work that I'm involved in, which is what is the role of business? Um, so I both advise businesses um, and also um, get involved in our thought leadership around what it means to be a leading business. What will it take to be a leading business in the future? So I wanted to share with you some of the kind of the insights. But before I do, I just want to um, really land what's really driving this. Why is it that businesses are needing to transform and so fast? Well, the reality is we're living well beyond our means. You may well have seen sort of similar data. This is what comes from the Earth Overshoot Day, which basically tracks, if you imagine, all of the, asset, all the natural, and, um, natural assets that we have, um, raw materials, clean air, fresh water, and so on and so forth. If we use that sustainably within a year, the Earth Overshoot Day would be the 31st of December. Okay? So we'd basically be using all of the available capital that could renew itself within one year. But actually, uh, 90, from 1970 onwards, we start, we pass that point. We're basically eating into that natural capital that we rely upon to renew and, and function our global economy. So actually this year is the 28th of July that globally we essentially used up all of the natural capital. From then on in, we're eating into that sort of natural capital globally. And of course that will vary from country to country, but that's the global picture. So essentially we're in a place where we have a massive imbalance between, if you like, the demand we're placing on nature and what nature can supply. So... We're basing our economic model on a high-waste, high-carbon business model, which we've essentially scaled up, and of course, of now globally, we're, we're running that economy, and we're scaling that up, which is... Um, and so, really, we're placing demands that, unfortunately, the planet is unable to um, adapt to with, uh, crucially, our current economic model. So I want to just briefly look at how does this play out at a business level. So if we take, for example, um, the humble fizzy drink and we think about what a business that makes a hum humble um, fizzy drink is required to report on, it's actually the financial value flow within the legal boundary of the business, which is actually pretty small. So as you can see here, it's as long as we're able to buy our raw materials, manufacture it and sell it at a higher price than we bought it for, we're in business and we're making a profit. But as one investor um, said to me, he said, the trouble with financial reports, it tells you how much money a company has made, but not how it's made it, and its ability to make that money into the future. So it's a little bit like, and it's only historically what that business has actually achieved financially. So it's a little bit like driving a car looking through the rearview mirror. And it's worse because it's only telling us part of the picture. It's telling us the financial picture and the financial flow of value, but that's pretty much it. Whereas we know the reality, of course, of running a, a business, which makes this can, is a lot more complex. We actually have a whole value network where we're both destroying and creating value right the way through that flow of value. So if we start, for example, we need to grow the oranges that go into the orange juice. Well, that requires soil health. It requires farmers to work those fields and not go for better paid jobs in the city. It needs a stable climate. It needs regular rainfall. And so, and so on, all of which is beginning to change. Then we sort of buy, it into, buy the raw materials, we make it, we draw down on the water table into the factory to go into the can, we use energy to shape the can, um, all of which draws on natural resources, we create carbon emissions, and then we pay dividends back to shareholders, that goes back into the economy, we, we may pay tax on it, um, depending on the tax arrangements of that company, and then we sell it, and then it gets used by the consumer. If it's part of a balanced diet, it becomes a treat. Or if it's not part of a balanced diet, it's fueling the obesity ep epidemic, which is creating huge social costs, both to society and also to um, uh, the NHS and so on for treating those, um, that, uh, those uh, health effects. Then we dispose of it, and depending on what happens to it, if I toss it into a landfill, then it's going to um, create a, a GHG gas, or it might go into a recycle, uh, recycled system. So it all depends. So throughout that system, we are creating and destroying value, which currently is invisible, 
according to our financial reports. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because we scaled this process up where those externalities is the technical term for it, which is basically it's costs that are external to the price you pay for it, means that they are essentially invisible and that they're scaled up so much now, as it's part of the global economy, society is no longer able to bear the cost of those negative impacts from the, the economy and businesses. And so that's why stakeholders are responding. Investors are wanting to know, what are your impacts? How are you exposed to things like climate change? How are you drawing down on nature? What are you doing about it? Consumers similarly are wanting to know, am I feeling guilty about drinking this can, or can I feel okay about it? Are you paying workers properly? What can I do with the can? So throughout, we're seeing it, and regulators are also starting to make changes as well, of course. Things like um, extended producer responsibility. So the manufacturers increasingly, as an example of polluter pay, so you're actually paying for those externalities. So that's shifting and shaping the expectations of how businesses operate, and that's why that's important. So what we need to see is this shift, really, from a system where we've kind of assumed that social value and natural value are abundant and stable. That's always been the assumption. Because if we go back to where financial reporting came from, it came from a previous crisis in the 1930s, because there wasn't consistent ways of understanding financial value. And interestingly, um, Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, did a great series of wreath lectures all about series of crises, and he pointed to how crises often happen when we don't value properly society um, different types of value impact. And climate change used an example um, of that as well. So we kind of assumed they were abundant and that financial value in the 1930s was scarce, whereas social and natural value were abundant. Arguably now, it's completely flipped. Now we have abundant financial value, but we have scarce social and natural value, which are neither consistent um, or abundant. So we need to think about how the system actually operates, which is financial value can only be created within stable and secure societies. And secure and stable societies can only operate within stable and secure um, planetary and natural limits and boundaries. And so this is the way we need to move. But that's a fundamental shift in the way the economy works at every level, from the GDP level, which only really tracks financial value as well. And again, it's not tracking the stocks and flows of social and natural capital at a GDP level. Same is true at a fund level. The same is true at a micro level for a business. So this is the shift that we're needing to see. So if that's the background then, what does leadership need to look like? If we're going to thrive as businesses in this future, well, I want to share with you a couple of insights, one of which, and some of which come from we collaborated with the British Standards Institute for the first ever um, principle-based standard for a sustainable purpose-led business. And you can find, if you Google PAS808 on BSI, you'll find it. It's free to download. It's only soft launch so far. We're going to do a full launch later on, so you can see that. And that talks about three aspects of business. The ends that the business is trying to achieve, so the purpose and strategy. It talks about the means it relies on, so that's, that's flows of natural and social capital on which the financial capital is dependent, so it looks at those. And then it looks at the methods, which is how the business operates and so on. And you'll see um, principles and descriptions and behaviours for each of those three elements of the business, which you can use to guide and shape. And we collaborated with thought leaders like people like Business in the Community, B Corp we've heard about today, um, Forum for the Future, we were also involved in it and so on. So, and as well as the British government, as well as consultants and leading businesses like Anglia Water, collaborated to create that standard. So I'm going to draw on a few, and I'm going to point to another free resource later on. So let's take an example of Tesla. Interestingly, they're now capitalised as the next 10 biggest um, car manufacturers put together. And they only turned a profit in 2019. But what's interesting about Tesla is that Elon Musk went back to first principles. He didn't ask himself, how do I make a car that goes a little bit faster and looks a little bit better than all the others? And a bit like you know, Ford famously said, if I'd asked what the consumer wanted, they said, I want a faster horse. Elon Musk went back to first principles and said, what is it kind of future mobility we need? And so for him, the vision was, how do we mainstream affordable electric vehicles? That was the vision. And so the whole entry point into the market was all building towards mainstreaming electric vehicles, and that's very much the pathway that Tesla's on. But what they're doing is they're not, they realise they have to shape the whole of the system around them to mainstream electric charging points, 
invest in battery technologies and so on and so forth. He couldn't necessarily deliver it through the existing business model. So he's gone back to first principles and said, what is it we need? How do we do this within those constraints, if you like, so not using fossil fuels and so on? So that's one example is Tesla. A very different business is Hammerson. Hammerson is a, a property uh, management. They manage um, uh, sh sort of shopping precincts and so on in London, Paris, around Europe. And what they did, similarly, they said, well, look, how, what are the kind of main impacts we're having on society, but it's both positive and negative? So they came up with this, um, this strategy, which is around being positive places. And the point here is that they're saying our major impact is carbon, the energy that both builds and operates our buildings. Also, it's the water we use and the socio-economic impacts through the running of our, of our retail estates. So they said we want to be net positive in those major impact areas. And so net positive is this idea that the business is putting back into the economy, nature and society more than it takes out. So again, rather than sort of that supply and demand again, it's balancing, if anything, benefiting society and nature more than it's drawing down on it. Okay? So they really identified what are their big material impact areas as a business. So what we're seeing, I think, is, is businesses then which are really aligning and saying, first of all, how do we really understand these big sustainability megatrends? How is our markets, our segments being shaped by these big megatrends in the future? So it's about foresight, not just insight today. How are customer needs changing? Are they becoming more urbanized? Are they becoming more water scarce and so on? Then they're understanding how can we positively play into that? And what these businesses are doing is saying, what are we really good at? What is our core competence? How does our core competence serve those changing needs in society? And so it's able to positively talk about its contribution in society rather than being apologetic for an old business model that's high waste, high carbon. And rather than saying we're going to do the wrong thing a bit better, we're actually going to do the right thing in the right way. That's the shift. So they're able to be positive about their role in society, which they've understood the wider context, and are unapologetically commercial, saying what are those new value propositions that we can have? What can we find? Even though that might mean creating new business models, they're bringing that sweet spot together. That's what they're really doing. And Tesla's a good example of that, even though, of course, they've got a way to go, like fixing the um, battery technology. Mm. So there's a number of benefits, really, that derives then if, by aligning the corporate purpose and the str um, strategy with a sustainable future. It allows you to shape that long-term direction. It allows you to really um, innovate those new value propositions. Rather than just sort of salami slicing you know, mature markets, it helps you understand and break into whole new value propositions and markets. It also helps to attract and retain you know, talent, stakeholders, suppliers, because one of the implications, I think, of the future moving forward is that we've been used to a demand-constrained economy where we could always produce more, we just need to demand more. So the focus has been there. But arguably, I think we'd like to shift to a supply-constrained economy where it's actually about how do we attract suppliers and those strategic um, raw materials and relationships to deliver our products and services. It allows agility by having a clear purpose rather than have to go up and down chains of command, but actually empowering and inspiring people to make decisions at the coalface and improving organisational um, performance and reducing those liabilities, those negative impacts on society, which increasingly consumers, governments and finance won't tolerate in future. So another quick example is um, Interface. So Interface, the carpet tile manufacturer um, in the US, they had a new strategy called Climate Take Back. And so what they did is they set a target with that new strategy. The CEO set out to say, we want to develop the first ever carbon negative carpet tile, these little fellas down here. Within a year, the R&D team had a prototype. And then a year later, they released their first ever carbon negative QQuest um, carpet tile. But through that innovation process, they found they could create the carpet tile backing, which the top layer goes onto, which could be carbon negative, uh, carbon neutral rather. And they say they invested in uh, manufacturing technology so that all their carpet tile backing was at least carbon, uh, carbon neutral. As an example of how they're using that understanding of how do we need to change and how fast to drive innovation. And then what they did is they then actually took that through the marketing, which was then aligned with their purpose as well. And um, so it's really an end to end. So from their purpose, driving through their innovation, through into their marketing. 
And what that does is it helps, I think, businesses. Once you're clear on how you're serving society through your core competence, and then like examples of Hammerson, you're being clear about how do we need to neutralize those negative impacts and where are we having a real positive impact on nature and society that's protecting and enabling our financial flows. It allows you to look at your portfolio. Because a lot of the businesses I see are looking at what's called, this is, comes from Futures Thinking, Horizon One, which are prevalent products and services today that aren't likely to be around in the future. And the internal combustion engine is a good example of that. Of course, in Europe, you won't be able to sell one um, from 2030 onwards. So they're prevalent today, but they're not going to be around tomorrow. Horizon 3 could be the element where you're having an electric vehicle you probably don't even own. You rent it, and it's part of an integrated transportation system. Not very prevalent today, but it's very much likely to be in the future. And then we have bridging technologies like hybrid cars, which are somewhere between the two. But as many businesses I see are stuck in Horizon 1, saying, how can we nudge out Horizon 1 for a little bit longer by making it less bad? They're not really thinking about Horizon 3, saying, what's this business going to look like in even 10 years, five years? And when you've got an innovation lead time of five to 10 years, depending on the industry you're in, you don't have time to sit on that. Because if you're investing in Horizon 1, you're putting a sell-by date on, the, on your business viability. So I think this is why this, it helps you think about the innovation um, portfolio. Another quick example is Umicore, just to give you another. So these guys are a Belgian business, which were all, in, uh, all about smelting um, uh, uh, metals. And what they did is they um, fundamentally pivoted their purpose into materials for a better life. And what they did is they sold off a lot of their big um, high smelting um, uh, zinc and copper um, business. They invested a tenfold increase in R&D over a 10 year period. And now they're leaders in the clean tech solutions. So as you can see here, working on recycling, energy surface technologies, and catalysts. But what they're doing is they're pivoting it all around chemistry, material science, and metallurgy. That's their core competence that moving from the old business into the new one. And of course, now they're set fair because now they're you know, into, the, into the, a low carbon future, circular economy, and clean tech. That's where they're set fair. So that gives you another example of how businesses can fundamentally pivot around their core capabilities. So just coming to land then, the final thing that I think is really critical is businesses can't do this on their own. There's only so much they can do. And that's one of the reasons why we work with both finance and government to create the access to finance and the regulatory environment to enable a sustainable economy. So what um, we did some work with um, four leading businesses to look at practically how they align their purpose and strategy and then implemented it and engaged externally. So that was Unilever, it was DSM, Interface Floor and IKEA. And we came up with over 50 practical things they did. It's available on our website. If you look for um, uh, leading with a sustainable purpose, you can see it there. Um, it's for free. And they found they had to, the, having that clarity on what their purpose was, who they're trying to serve and how, put into sharp relief what they were good at and where they didn't have those relationships or capabilities they needed to foster and create. So it put some sharpness on the partnerships. Also, the advocacy. Where were their regulatory barriers, for example, to un unlock the circular economy, for example? What it also found is that partners were coming to them. They said, hey, we see you've got this low-carbon strategy or you want to move to a circular economy. We've got technology. We've got relationships that can help with that. And it drew those partners towards them. They also integrated purpose into their metrics and external disclosure. So rather than just telling a story of here's how we create financial value, they were able to articulate how that financial value was dependent on sustaining natural and social flows of value as well, right the way down to who they're serving, how they're serving them, which communities they're impacting and reliant upon, how they're reliant on nature as inputs, outputs, and impacts, and they're able to tell that story and track the metrics. So they're providing, rather than the current financial value, which is looking like the world in black and white, it does tell you that's true, but it's not telling you the full story. It gives more of a color picture. It gives the full color of here's all the forms and flows of value that we're reliant on as, as a business to be viable both now and into the future. And it's part of a, a connected narrative. And also that flows through, therefore, also into the corporate positioning and the communications, the corporate communications. So it's not like they tell their investors one thing and then they tell you know, NGOs and consumers another thing. It's part of that integrated narrative. And you can, as I say, find that um, report on our website, which sort of summarizes those, those insights. So a couple of resources there for you. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Obviously, it's a complex um, you know, transition, transforming businesses. But we believe that that's what businesses is in their best interests 
to serve society in a sustainable way, to safeguard both their future and, and all of ours as society. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ben. Brilliant as usual. Um, before we take any questions from the floor, uh, by the way, if you do have a question, please put your hand up and my colleague Tom will happily bring the microphone over to you. Uh, so Ben, let's say a business is just beginning its journey. Yeah. Where do you start? Great question. I'd say first of all, it's probably about finding out good enough what your material area of impact size. It's about involving, I think, a cross-section of the business so that you've got those value chain represented. So somebody from marketing, procurement, R&D, for example, or the equivalent in the business. And starting to, let's say, get a good enough understanding of where our impacts across the value chain. And now one of the big challenges is scope three, but using proxies, industry um, uh, research, there's a number of sources that can be used just to start to map that out and start to map out that value network and say, what are our order of magnitude? Where are our big impacts? Um, where are positive and negative impacts? Starting to test that with, I think, external stakeholders can be really helpful who are either these stakeholders who represent those impacts, um, to just share with them what they see as being changing, how are those future trends impacting that business model, to start to create that conversation internally about what might we do differently. Um, because it's very easy to focus, a lot of businesses make the mistake of just looking at their direct impacts, which for a lot of businesses are in single figure percentages, what's important overall. And then missing that opportunity to say, well, how are we enabling our consumers to lead more sustainable um, lifestyles and options? What are we doing to engage with our supply chain? Which often where the big wins are, both in terms of the sweet spot of it helps differentiate the business, open up new markets, and having a positive impact. So I'd say recognize you're on a journey, and it's more, I think, like a spiral. As you start to engage people, ask questions, you can start to take action, learn from it, and then you can start to formulate it as more of a strategic response and allow yourself that journey. But I'd say get a, get a group representing the business, starting to ask those questions would be a good place to start. And don't let perfection be the enemy of the good, as Voltaire said. <laughs> You quoted Voltaire. I was just about to do so. <laughs> oh, sorry to um, pick that one from me, Scott. So, um, so let's say you are just, or an organisation watching this is just starting out on their journey. Um, does that mean they're behind the curve? And so if they are, how quickly do they need to catch up? You know, what's the rate of transformation that companies need to tackle? It, it's a good question. We talk about evidence-based targets because I think there's a real risk of lulling yourself into a false sense of security, you know, which is even what the regulation is, let alone what do our customers need of us, usually the, the risk is. But I think the, the danger of that, I use the analogy, it's a bit like a flotilla trying to go from sort of Portsmouth to New York. And like a lot of big companies particularly, they're, they're um, oligopolies, and so they're looking at their c competition. They're not really saying, what are we benchmarking against? About what keeps us under the radar of the regulators, you know, and so on. So the risk is they're all following each other, and they're trying to get to New York, but they end up down in South America because they're all following each other, they don't know where they're going. So it's really important you're navigating by the stars, in contrast, and that means evidence base. So for us, you know, that's looking at UN science coming out of the IPCC on climate and similarly on nature. And that, I think, should be saying where are your impacts and using evidence base to say let's track that. That tells us how, what we need to change and how fast. And that should really be the North Star that's driving the innovation um, into the business. And then what I think that does is that then catalyzes the sort of relationships. It puts into sharp relief who they need to team up with um, and draw on. There's a loads of free materials out there, loads of great sources, depending on what those impact areas are. We've heard from them, like the Carbon Trust, Business in the Community, we provide that. There's low WBCSD. There's so many sources of really great stuff. WRI, um, drawing all those free materials and advice out there as well, I'd say. OK, thank you. Did we have any questions? Who's got the mic? Ah, there you go. Uh, if you could please just state your name and where you're from, please. And make it an easy one, please. <laughs> um, it's on. It's on. OK. Um, <laughs> my name's Danielle Anderson. I'm from a thought leadership consultancy called Man Bites Dog. That's our name, I know. Um, but no, totally agree about the needing to put financial value on uh, social and natural capital. Um, but how would you go about monetizing that? You know, you work with finance, you work with government, there's got to be some sort of ROI. So how would you go about defining that and monetizing that natural capital and how would that affect GDP? 
Yeah, it's a good, it's a good shout. And often what I refer to this as is it's a case of like mind the gap, you know, like we're having the tube right between the platform and the and the train. And we've got one here, which is between where regulation and what investors are looking for and what was currently being reported on and where the, if you like the pounds are, the dollars in that transaction. We're moving very quickly in that direction. But I think at the moment it's about first of all understanding those flows and talking to probably particularly progressive regulators, investors and customers who are already looking at that through their sustainability strategies, but in a similar way of asking their business partners say what are you doing to either limit those negative impacts and so on or positive ones and at least articulating those and showing your assumptions around how you're you know both avoiding negative impacts enabling future ones so even if you can't put a straight pound against it directly what it can do is help both prepare when that does come and it's not far you know around the corner you know things like for example the green taxonomy you know coming out of Europe for example is having material impacts and access to finance as an example but also what it does is it, is it helps to you know, build that relationship with your customers, suppliers, and so on. Even, and so it's helping to differentiate in the meantime. So I think it's about preparing for that and by understanding where those impacts are, articulating the benefits, um, and, say, and using quantitative and qualitative data. That's what these leaders are doing, is using those um, as we sort of are basically stepping over that gap. But I think it's closing so rapidly, as I'm sure you're aware, that whole non-financial reporting area is moving so fast that, you know, and again, if business is saying, oh, well, we'll do something when it arrives, too late, you know, too late by that point. Now's the time to operate um, and start to understand that. And so it's all part of an integrated value proposition, I'd say. Okay, thank you. That's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. If anyone does have any questions specifically for Ben, and if you download the app, then you'll be able to ask questions direct, and obviously you can reach out to Ben via his website LinkedIn. and email and everything LinkedIn. else. LinkedIn. I'm around over LinkedIn. lunch if you want a natter. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you.